Hello, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition from NPR. Uh, this is where we talk about how businesses are building resilience during this challenging time. In the window next to me is Jesse Woolley Wilson. Hello, Jesse. Hello. He is the CEO of Dreambox. Um, if you're a parent or you work at a school or you know school kids, you might know Dreambox. Um, it's an online software company that offers math programs for K through eighth graders. Um, it's used in schools all across the U.S. and in several other countries. My kids use it, so I know it well. Um, obviously, things are busy right now um, for ed tech companies as millions of children prepare to go back to school virtually, remotely, and online um, in just a couple of weeks. Um, some of them have already started. Um, by the way, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or LinkedIn, welcome. Um, please submit your questions for Jesse. We'd love to take your questions. Um, first of all, Jesse, uh, where are you? How have you been holding up these past several months? Well, I'm in Bellevue, Washington, uh, Dreambox's headquarters. And it's just been about adaptivity. Things are changing. I feel like we're all of us in schools, parents, we're all trying to build the plane as we fly it and just try to stay in a place where we're learning and applying that learning as quickly as possible, knowing full well, we'll make some mistakes. Yeah. So for people who, who aren't familiar with it, can you just kind of give us a, a back of an envelope description of Dreambox? Sure. Dreambox is a K through eight math program that delivers personalized learning for every child on, on it. So it's engaging. Kids think they're doing games, but they're actually doing very serious math learning. And it's available in schools, as you said. But it's also available to parents. You can just call in and and get a per parent subscription for your child if your school doesn't have it. So you have, I think, about 270 plus employees now, um, most yeah. of them in Bellevue, some in Raleigh. You've got sales teams around the country. First of all, how are you managing the, <laughs> the staff remotely? It's been a lot of of change for us. So there were two phases of this evolution post COVID. First phase was to survive. And the second phase was to thrive. And in the survive phase, we, we were guided by our company values and by three, three principles really. The first is, what do we do to take care of our employees? We want them to be safe and secure. And we closed the office early, early March before many other people did. And then the second was, what do we do to take care of our school customers? our kids and our teachers and school administrators. And we figured if we took care of our, our staff, then we could take care of our customers. And then the third piece was if we take care of our customers, then we will take care of our company as best as possible. So the default was not what do we do to take care of revenue? The default was what do we do to take care of our talent so that we can take care of our customers? If we do that, we will do everything we can to protect revenue in the company. How, for example, I mean, I know you've got sales teams, and we'll talk yes. we'll go into this in a, in a bit, um, who, who sell your product to school districts around the country. I mean, traditionally, I'm assuming they would go to the offices, they would meet with administrators, they would show them the product. How have they been able to, 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 to sell? You know, we didn't know what was going to happen. We were, as you said, we had field sales reps that were used to going in and having face-to-face -face conversations with district administrators. They consider themselves partners. And when schools shut down, we said, what's gonna happen to our sales channel? I mean, will we be able to get a hold of people in the C-suite, you know, district administrators, superintendents, you know, online learning specialists, math specialists, how are we going to connect with them? And what we found was that they were working very hard to figure out what they could do to keep learning going on, even if schools closed. And they were open to hearing from trusted partners like Dreambox. And I will say that because we years ago decided to subject ourselves to the scrutiny of third party evaluators, in this case, Harvard University, I think they were looking for proxies for quality and reliability when this crisis hit. And I think that helped us um, maintain relationships and maintain access. So Jesse, as you know, as the pandemic um, kind of began to unfold and as schools really began to shut down quickly, what what was the economic impact on, on your business? I mean, um, was there a slowdown? Was there a rush to sign up? What what did what happened? 
So in the beginning, we didn't know what was going to happen. So we decided to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And so we cut back on all of our expenses dramatically. We moved everybody to work from home. That meant we weren't spending as much money on travel. We didn't go to any conferences. There's a lot of education conferences where we meet, you know, principals and district administrators. We cut out all of those. And we really cut out everything that we have re relied on for the past 10 years to cultivate customers. And we didn't know what was gonna happen. Then I got together with my team and I said, what do we do to help teachers through this? We have to figure out a way to demonstrate our partnership. And they said, what we should do is open up the platform for free throughout the whole school year so mm -hmm. that they don't have, they have many, many things to worry about. They won't have to worry about math instruction. That will be one thing they won't have to worry about. So I went to my board. I said, the thing that we should do is to open up the platform so that if a district had, you know, three of 50 schools on Dreambox, they could put the remaining 47 on for free through the end of June, just so that they could keep their kids learning at home. And we figured the best thing to do was to go to our existing customers because they were already trained. They had people in the, in the district who could be resources to parents and to children. And, and we didn't know if we were gonna be able to train them. So we did that. And within six weeks, we nearly doubled the number of students on, wow. you know, schools and, and, and districts were really desperate. So fifth wow. in five weeks. So, so that many, was over yeah. 2 million students that were added. So, so to 2 million students added in five weeks. How much, so how many total students are using the, the platform? So over 5 million wow. students. Uh, K through eight are using Dreambox through our schools. Solution. What does that? Yeah, what does that mean for your your product team and and you know the the engineers <laughs> who are who are all of a sudden onboarding two million kids in five weeks? So I love that question because when I say that, most people say, "Oh, that's so great!" You know, you had exponential growth. And it's what crazy. I say in response to that is, when you grow really fast, you get stretch marks. Yeah, and we got stretch marks. So our stretch marks were our support system was overwhelmed. And this was at a time when they were usually, it was a low period typically. So gearing up for the fall, busy back to school season. And so we looked at our team and we said, you're gonna have to sprint now. And we know that you're gonna have to sprint again when schools open in the fall. We thought they were gonna open in the fall. And it was very, very difficult because it meant that we had to stretch ourselves. And the one thing I didn't mention earlier as part of our operations uh, reduction, our cost reduction, we moved everybody to a four day work week. Wow. And so at the time that we moved them to a four day work week, expecting very low volumes, expecting no sales, expecting nobody to use the system, we had an explosion of new customers, an explosion of kids on the system. And I, I just told the team, you know, there's a lot that we don't know. I'm going to tell you what I know and I'm going to tell you what I don't know. We're going to meet every month instead of every quarter. And I hope that with every successive month, what I know is going to start to creep up and be more than what I don't know. Yeah. And a lot of people said, you can't lead like that. You can't tell people what you don't know. But people already know what we don't know. Is right. They, they need to know that you're going to be you know, authentic about that. And they appreciated that, even though I didn't have a lot of answers for them. So are you hiring? I mean, have you opened up positions? So we, we put a hold on hiring for the first, for that survive phase. And now we have, we, everybody's back to work. We came back earlier than expected in early July. We came back 100%. And so now we are starting the recruiting process again. Wow. So I will tell you guys, though, we expected that all the schools were going to open up at least partially and maybe have, you know, Monday, Wednesday and Friday in school and Tuesday and Thursday at home or some other kind of hi hybrid model. Right. But in the last two weeks, we've seen an acceleration of schools deciding that they're going to stay 100 percent remote through the end of the calendar year. Um, so that means that. Yeah. yeah. No, no, please go ahead. So that, that means that the, the teachers that we were gonna train so that they would know how to use Dreambox are not in schools. So all of our professional development had to be put on hold or used with a, with a Zoom, for example. And it's really, as soon as you think you have something understood, you have to adapt right. because it changes and you just have to stay flexible. Yeah. By the way, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or LinkedIn, welcome LinkedIn viewers. 
Um, we're taking your questions uh, on Dreambox education. Any questions for Jesse? So please keep them coming. We'll get to them um, in just a minute. One of your, I mean, your main sort of strategy, sales strategy, is you deal with school districts and administrators, not parents. And I guess when you joined the, the company in 2010, there was this kind of hi more hybrid model where parents were targeted, the consumer was targeted, and now it's really school districts. I wonder whether now, you know, if, if you know, many parents decide, and I don't know what the, the numbers are, but if a significant number of parents decide to homeschool or to kind of opt out of, of, of virtual learning through their schools, um, is there a world where, where you start to pivot again and focus on consumers again? Well, it's such a great question, Guy, because a lot of people don't realize you're right. In 2010, we started to move toward the B2B model but I didn't shut down the school, the parent channel, the consumer channel. We knew that there were teachers there and administrators there, you know, in the parent channel. And we thought that if we could win their confidence, it would help the institutional side of the business. So the other thing that we did is that we opened up Dreambox through the end of August now for parents. They could get a free trial so that parents who were working from home and being overwhelmed while they were at home would know that they could find a solution that was proven to be effective, that was engaging for their kids for mathematics with Dreambox for no cost. So we, we offered that trial for parents. And I don't think we're ever gonna move away from parents. We think parents are the X factor, you know, right. and we think teachers, technology should never be designed to replace teachers. I think 40%, the last count that we, 40% of the employees at Dreambox are former educators. We don't think that technology should replace the learning guardian. We think technology should do what technology does best, which is to help understand the thinking process of children and to give them actionable insights so that they can modify their instructional strategy and personalize it to be more high impact for every child. Let me go to a question from our audience. This is from Jaguna Hillary. Um, she says she is volunteering as a teacher. She's been working with kids since schools have shut down. One disturbing thing she says she's noticed is that a lot of kids don't have access to online learning opportunities or their parents may not even know about them. Um, I mean, Jesse, you're a business. You're a venture-backed business. You have to earn a profit. Um, how, how do you make what, what you do and sell um, available to every kid so there's two things i would like to say here it's really important that the one thing that keeps me up at night when i think about online learning is that it might widen the gap between the haves and the have-nots and we all as a society have to be very intentional about making sure that we don't um lose sight of that and that we work very hard to make sure that every child regardless of their zip code frankly has access to great learning experiences. So one of the reasons we moved from the consumer approach to the institutional approach is to bring, to make sure that we brought Dreambox to every child. We brought Dreambox to where all kids were in schools, not just to the parents who happen to know about it, you know, but to institutions and communities where parents might not be aware of it. So that's one, one thing, but we need to make sure that some structural impediments like broadband access and device access are targeted to the least well-served communities. And what I'm encouraged by is that the CARES Act and a lot of what districts are using with federal funds is to address device and broadband access. Now, the good news is that almost 90% of kids have access to broadband and devices but that doesn't help those, the 10% that right. does it. So we need to work with libraries and we need to work with foundations and we need to work with you know, private public partnerships while we develop policies and funding mechanisms to close those remaining gaps. The last 10% is gonna be the hardest, but we can never let, let up on that. I mean, in a sense, you, your your business is kind of like a pharmaceutical company, right? Because you you you're putting in a lot of R and D into this product. It's expensive, but then you create something that's a public good that everybody kind of needs, right? But then somebody has to pay for it. Um, is there a world where, um, you know, part of what you do, or there's a sort of a spin-off part of Dreambox that is 
a nonprofit or that is funded by foundations to make what you 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 sell free and accessible to a huge chunk of kids? I think that there's a lot of possibility there. And uh, about three years ago, we worked with the Gates Foundation to try to accelerate our development to make sure that teachers needs were met on Dreambox Learning. As I mentioned, it was really intended for kids to be able to do on their on their own in its original conceit. And as we moved to schools, we knew we had to do more to engage the educators, what we call the learning guardians. So the Gates Foundation gave us a grant to accelerate the development of our educator um, uh, solution. And that is an example of what you just said, public-private partnership coming together. The other thing I would like to say is about three, uh, two years ago, we raised uh, funding, additional funding to help our growth. And we had a lot of choices at, th at that time. There were 12 suitors that wanted to become primary owners of Dreambox Learning. And we selected TPG's The Rise Fund, which is an impact investment mm -hmm. fund. And we chose them because they shared our goals and our mission about the importance of impacting student opportunity, as well as supporting a high growth business. So it's a double bottom line that we take very, very seriously. And we yeah. are obliged to report our, our impact to our new investors at the Rise Fund, as much as our growth trajectory. Right. And I think because of that blend, when we went to the Rise Fund and we said, we wanna give open up this platform and give it away for free, they were supportive even though it was uncertain how many of those free users would actually convert to customers over the long yeah. term. Um, obviously this is a business show and a lot of our viewers <laughs> and listeners um, come from the, uh, the business world or entrepreneurs. Um, this is a question from Noah Thomas. He asks, um, do you think that, that given that the marketplace for remote learning is already shifting and will probably shift even more post pandemic, um, do, do you imagine just an explosion of opportunity for educational technology companies in the next, you know, five, 10 years, may, maybe a, an accelerated uh, series of opportunities? I absolutely did. One of the things that we did several months ago was we studied the marketplace and we studied industries that had V-shaped recoveries that were anticipated, U-shaped recoveries and L-shaped recoveries. So maybe a, a cruise line is, is not gonna come back, it's an L shape. Maybe right. an airline is a U shape, but we really feel like education technology is a V shape. And we're seeing that now. We've had explosive growth in users, as I mentioned, and we, we expect that that is gonna continue in, for the future because we feel like people who were trying out learning technologies as a nice to have compliment, now have been forced with forced distance learning to see it as a must have. And so if they have good experiences and they see that it complements what they wanna do in the classroom and at home, we don't see any end in the growth opportunities for proven, effective, engaging, and reliable learning technologies like Dreambox. Jesse, as you know, um, already now it's school is, is coming back in a lot of places. And by the end of this month, most kids will be back in school. Most kids in, in the U.S., I believe, will, will be um, learning remotely. Um, yeah. This is a question um, that we're, we're also getting from some of our viewers from uh, Chitor Moy Day um, via LinkedIn. Can remote learning truly work for all children? And can it ever replicate or even replace or be as good as in-person classroom instruction for children? So there's a lot of research that shows that the most important variable for student success is their teacher. I don't think that's going to change in the long term. I think there are things that humans will do and continue to do that technology will not be able to do. I fundamentally believe that technology should be used to support human beings, humanity, to serve humanity versus the other way around. That being said, I think that we will not return to how things were before COVID. I think we're all moving and marching toward a new normal. And that new normal is gonna have blended learning as a permanent feature of the best learning. 
because technologies can understand what is happening in a very nuanced way. And technologies can help personalize learning and give learning guardians actionable insights. What should I do to support Sally's growth in this moment? Dynamic information that changes and adapts to what a child needs moment to moment. And it's that modality that will help kids with special needs, as well as quote, the gifted and talented. I think all kids are talented, but for kids who need acceleration and are ready for more advanced work, the system can help alert the teacher that when the child is ready and what specifically that child is ready to do. That's very difficult for even the best teacher in the best um, resource school to be able to personalize learning instantaneously for 30 kids at once. Even the best teacher in the best circumstance can't do that. But the nimble personalized learning technologies like Dreambox Learning can do that instantaneously, very effectively at scale, at scale. And so when the, the trick is to connect what the technology can do with the in-person learning experience to bring it to a new level. Yeah, that's the trick. You know, I'm so inspired by these ideas you're talking about, right? This idea that um, all of these incredible innovations now happening at an accelerated pace that can make learning more accessible um, and more efficient. But a, a big part of me is also so worried because I think of kids who rely on school as a safe place. School is probably one of the safest places yes. most kids they can be during the day. Um, it's where so many kids are fed um, and are, um, are looked after, you know? And, and so I, I have very mixed feelings about what's happening now as a parent myself and seeing it with my own kids, you know, seeing all the remote learning they're doing. Well, I would say that it's, you're justified to be concerned but I would always also encourage you to be very hopeful about what might happen. Imagine a classroom where a teacher is um, empowered with more information about all of her 20 kids, and she has more confidence and more agency about what to do with her marginal minute or marginal hour of time. We have a, we are at a precipice now, and we can actually, through this technology, make that moment very impactful. And so we can reduce the waste. We can reduce the frustration of children who are bored to tears because they've already mastered a concept and they're ready to move forward, but the teacher isn't aware of that. We can remove the frustration of a child who is struggling and who is still kept in that same lesson because the teacher doesn't know. And we can move to a model where the teacher can use the data from a system like Dreambox to organize her class and do rotations so that kids who are advanced can be in one group or kids who are struggling can be in a different group. And she can modify her live instruction to make sure she delivers exactly what that smaller group needs when they need it and have the confidence that when she's not with the smaller group and the other two groups are on Dreambox, they're getting exactly what they need when they need it in a very encouraging, supportive, scaffolded environment. I mean, you've seen it with, with your kids. Yeah. I wish that, I fundamentally believe that talent abounds and talent lives everywhere. It's that opportunity doesn't. And what we're trying to do at Dreambox is to bridge the gap between talent and opportunity. We believe all kids are mathematicians. We believe all kids have a spark and we need to make sure that their learning environment is, is structured in a way and is designed in a way that we can show that not only to uh, everybody else, but more importantly, to that child. Mm. We want that child to know that they can do anything that they wanna do. Yeah, we did, um, uh, I used to host a show called the TED Radio Hour and we did a whole episode on math. And, and this very idea that all human beings are born as mathematicians, it's just a language. And if you, if you teach them that language from a very young age, they, they'll speak it just like they speak their, 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 their spoken language. Exactly. Yeah. Um, this is a question from Mary, Mary Eileen. Um, she says, teachers in her district um, embraced and used Dreambox right away after, and, you know, after the pandemic struck. Um, 
one day when we go back to the classroom, do you see Dreambox being used in the classroom along with the teacher? Yes. The thing I'm most excited about is that the relationship between the home-based learning guardian and the school-based learning guardian is morphing right before our eyes. So we can help to demystify what's happening in a classroom for parents. And we can help teachers understand what's happening at home when they're not with their students. And we think that's a powerful partnership that we can help shape and support with technologies like Dreambox Learning. So I think the future is bright. I think that the, the thing I would ask the audience to think about and maybe to let go of is a desire to go back to how things were. Mm. I think that we should be in pursuit of a new normal and a normal that has learned and grown from this horrible pandemic that we're all managing through so that parents become the empowered, informed and supportive partner, even to a higher degree than they already are with teachers in a classroom. And I feel like the walls and the ceilings can melt away and we can build a permanent and robust connection between the home and school that is in the best service of children, all children. Um, I, that, yeah, I mean, I agree that, that, that you know, <laughs> to, to your point, here I am doing a live uh, TV <laughs> podcast from the my garage in Oakland, California. We would never have done this um, six right. months ago. It would have taken us two years to come up with this concept. And we just one day said, let's do it. Our audience sure. needs us. You know, we need to be there for our, our community. Um, are there... Um, are there public schools or school districts that you may know of, and I'm sure that you're consulted from time to time, um, that are potentially ready to open yet? I mean, we've seen some schools in some countries. I just read an article in the New York Times today about Israel. They opened the schools. They had to shut them down again really quickly. You know, some countries in Europe did the same thing. Um, is is there a part of and, and places in the United States that might potentially be ready to open that you know of? So this is such a hard question. I think that in the absence of a national strategy that will optimize frequent testing and tracing, it's very, very difficult to anticipate when a school will be safe. That's the first thing. The second thing is there are conditions and requirements for the learning environment, just like the home environment or the office environment that you would need to have in place. So do you have sanitizers? Do you have enough masks? How do you mitigate the risk with distance requirements? So all of those things need planning and I think the support of a national strategy in order for parents and teach for, for teachers to feel safe going in there, for parents to feel safe sending their child there. And I don't think that many districts feel that level of confidence yet. As I said, a month ago, I probably would have anticipated that 50% of the districts would have, would be returning in some hybrid model. I think that number is closer to 10% yeah. now. I just don't, I think we've learned with the acceleration of this virus that there's more about this virus that we don't know than we thought. And so I feel right now we're in a pause and I feel like the, the next window is really after January to see how we get through the fall and the winter. And once there's a vaccine in place and once there are effective treatments in place, I will have a different answer for you. But in this moment, I am not aware of any many districts that are confident that they can send their kids back to school full time now. I want to ask you one one last question before we let you go about your leadership style. You've been at the company for ten years. Um, yeah. You're obviously experiencing incredible growth right now. Um, you've led with a concept that you call benevolent friction, uh, um, and it's a, it's part of your culture. How, how does it work? So benevolent friction is trying to capture the importance of courageous conversations. We want to be hard on ideas but soft on people. We believe our work is so important to democratize learning opportunity that we wanna to try to leave our ego aside and be willing to subject what we think is the best idea or best innovation 
to the scrutiny of our peers who share our mission and share our values about unlocking learning potential. And so in order for you to do that with confidence, you have to be willing to subject yourself to the scrutiny of your peers and to hear that there are ways to make something good better. Something we, we're in pursuit of greatness for all kids. So benevolent friction is really a signal that says, I'm going to have a hard conversation with you, but it's not really about you. It's about the idea. And it's about the idea that we think will help accelerate our growth so we can serve more kids. And most importantly, accelerate the impact that we can have to make sure that every child is successful in learning math on Dreambox. Benevolent friction. Love it. Jesse, Jesse Willie Wilson, CEO of Dreambox, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Guy. It was a pleasure. And thanks to everybody who was watching. Um, I can't get to all of you, but Kern Boucher in South Africa, Ne Songeni in Guam, Mary Eileen, thanks for your question in Amherst, Mana Fernandez in Dubai, so many others. Thank you for watching this Friday. We'll be right back here at noon Eastern with Brian Chesky, the co-founder of Airbnb. Um, he's going to be talking about, obviously, their challenges and, and how Airbnb has kind of rolled with, with the situation. Um, so be sure to tune in here, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern this Friday. I'll be live with Brian Chesky, the co-founder and CEO of Airbnb. Um, if you haven't heard it, we released a brand new episode of How I Built This. It came out yesterday. It's a story of Vita Coco. It is so amazing and surprising. There are rollerblades and there are there's subterfuge and there's sabotage and dirty tricks and all kinds of craziness. Um, it's such a cool story about the coconut water wars of the early 2000s. Check it out. Um, I will see you back here Friday. Jesse, thank you once again. It's great, great having you on. Thank you. Happy learning math.